right, hello. Welcome once again to our virtual neighborhood. Um, we are in the midst of the horse and his boy, and we are at chapter 10, the Hermit of the Southern March. So let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We ask through, through the intercession of Saint Bridget that we might be able to always come to Jesus and to recognize the great love that he showed us when he died upon the cross. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So notice how we're just a little early today because um, I have a I have a class actually right after this. So, um, but let's get on with it. So if you remember last time, we um, were hearing about the the treacherous plan of Prince Rabadash, who is sending an army up to try to take Archenland by surprise and then capture Queen Susan in Narnia. Um, and so that's happening right now. The horses and Avarice and um, Shasta, they traveled across the desert. They found that secret pass. Um, and so they were actually making good time, but do you remember how they fell asleep? And then Bree started to say, even when Huynh, the horse, was saying, no, we can keep going, um, he put her in her place in not a very nice way, saying, I think I know more about this um, in a very prideful way. And he was just kind of going slow and slow. And ultimately, uh, you know, they're, they're starting off much later than... Uh, than they uh, would have originally planned. So that's where we are right now. So chapter 10, The Hermit of the Southern March. After they had ridden for several hours down the valley, it widened out and they could see what was ahead of them. The river, which they had been following here, joined a broader river, wide and turbulent, which flowed from their left to their right toward the east. Beyond this new river, a delightful country rose gently in the low hills, ridge beyond ridge, to the northern mountains themselves. To the right, there were rocky pinnacles, one or, left, or, one or two of them with snow clinging to the ledges. To the left, pine-clad slopes, frowning cliffs, narrow gorges, and blue peaks stretched away as far as the eye could reach. He could no longer make out Mount, P Mount Pyre, Straight ahead, the mountain range sank to a wooded saddle, which, of course, must be the pass from Archenland to Narnia. Oh, the north, the green north, neighed Bree, and certainly the lower hills looked greener and fresher than anything that Erebus and Shasta, with their southern-bred eyes, had ever imagined. Spirits rose as they clattered down the water's meat of the two rivers. The eastern flowing river, which was pouring from the higher mountains at the western end of the range, was far too swift and too broken with rapids for them to think of swimming it. But after some casting about, up and down the bank, they found a place shallow enough to wade. The, war, the roar and clatter of water, the great swirl against the horse's fetlocks, the cool, stirring air, and the darting dragonflies filled Shasta with a strange excitement. Friends, we are in Archenland, said Bree proudly as he splashed and churned his way out on the northern bank. I think that river we've just crossed is called the Winding Arrow. I hope we're in time, murmured Huynh. Then they began going up slowly and zigzagging a good deal, for the hills were steep. It was all open, park-like country with no roads or houses in sight. Scattered trees, never thick enough to be a forest, were everywhere. Shasta, who had lived all his life in an almost treeless grassland, had never seen so many or so many kinds. If you had been there, you would have probably known, he didn't, that he was seeing oaks, beeches, silver birches, rowans, and sweet chestnuts. Rabbits scurried away in every direction as they advanced, and presently they saw a, her a whole herd of fallow deer making off among the trees. Isn't it simply glorious, said Avarice. 
At the first ridge, Shasta turned in the saddle and looked back. There is no sign of Tashban. The desert, the unbroken, the un unbroken except by the green narrow crack which they had traveled down, spread to the horizon. Hello, he said suddenly. What's that? What? What? said Bree, turning round. Quinn and Avarice did the same. That, said Shasta, pointing. It, it looks like smoke. Is it a fire? Stand storm, I should say, said Bree. Not much wind to raise it, said Aravis. Oh, said, exclaimed Quinn, look, there are things flashing in it. Look, they're helmets and armor. It's moving, moving this way. By Tash, said Avarice, it's the army. It's Rabadash. Of course it is, said Quinn. Just what I was afraid of. Quick. We must get to Anvard before it. And without another word, she whisked round and began galloping north. Bree tossed his head and did the same. Come on, Bree, come on, yelled Avarice over her shoulder. This, grace, this race was very grueling for the horses. As they topped each ridge, they found another valley and another ridge beyond it. And though they knew they were going in more or less the right direction, no one knew how far it was to Anvard. From the top of the second ridge, Shasta looked back again. Instead of a dust cloud, well out into the, in the desert, he now saw a black moving mass, rather like ants on the far bank of the winding arrow. They were doubtless looking for a ford. They're on the river, he yelled wildly. Quick, quick, shouted Avarice. We might as well not have come at all if we don't reach Anvard in time. Gallop, Bree, gallop. Remember, you're a war horse. It was all Shasta could do to present himself, prevent himself from shouting out similar instructions, but he thought, the poor chap's doing all he can already, and held his tongue. And certainly, both horses were doing, if not all that they could, all they thought they could, which is not quite the same thing. Bree had caught up with Quinn, and they thundered side by side over the turf. It didn't look, it didn't look as if Quinn could possibly keep it up much longer. At that moment, Everyone's feelings were completely altered by a sound from behind. It was not the sound that they had been expecting, the noise of hooves and jingling armor mixed, perhaps with Kalorman battle cries. Yet Shasta knew it at once. It was the same snarling roar that he had heard that moonlit night when they first met Avarice and Quinn. Bree knew it too. His eyes gleamed red and his ears lay flat back on his skull. And Bree now discovered that he had not really been going as fast, not quite as fast as he could. Shasta felt the change at once. Now they were really going all out. In a few seconds, they were all well ahead of Quinn. It's not fair, thought Shasta. I did think we'd, that we'd be safe from lions here. He looked over his shoulder. Everyone was only too clear. Everything was only too clear. A huge, tawny creature, its body low to the ground, like a cat streaking across the lawn to a tree with a strange dog, has got into the garden, was behind him. It was nearer every second and half second. He looked forward again and saw something which he did not take in, or even think about. Their way was barred by a smooth green wall about ten feet high. In the middle of that wall, there was a gate opened. In the middle of the gateway stood a tall man dressed, and down to his bare feet in a robe colored like autumn leaves, leaning on a straight staff. His beard, felt, his beard fell almost to his knees. Shasta saw all this in a glance and looked back again. The lion had almost got Quinn now. It was making snaps at her hind legs, and there was no hope now in her foam-flecked, wide-eyed face. Stop, bellowed Shasta in Bree's ear. Must go back. Must help. Bree always said afterward that he never heard or never understood this, and as what as he was in general a very truthful horse, we must accept his word. Shasta slipped his feet out of the stirrups, slid both his legs over on the left side, hesitated for one hideous hundredth of a second, and jumped. It hurt horribly and nearly winded him, but before he knew how it hurt him, there was a staggering back to help Aravis. He had never done anything like this in his life before, and hardly knew while he was do why he was doing it now. One of the most terrible noises in the world, a horse's scream, broke through Quinn's lips. Erebus was stooping low 
Aravis was stooping low over Quinn's neck, and it seemed to be and seemed to be trying to draw her sword. And now all three, Aravis, Quinn, and the lion, were almost on top of Shasta. Before they had reached him, the lion rose on his hind legs, larger than you would have believed a lion could be, and jabbed at Aravis with its right paw. Shasta could see all the terrible claws extended. Avaris screamed and reeled in the saddle. The lion was tearing her shoulders. Shasta, half mad with horror, managed to lurch toward the brute. He had no weapon, not even a stick or a stone. He shouted out idiotically at the lion as one would, would at a dog. Go home! Go home! For a fraction of a second, he was staring right into the wide, open, raging mouth. Then, to its, his utter astonishment, the lion, still on its hind legs, checked itself suddenly, turned head over heels, picked itself up, and rushed away. Shasta did not for a moment suppose that it had gone for good. He turned and raced for the gate in the green wall, which now for the first time he remembered seeing. Quinn, stumbling and nearly fainting, was just entering the gate. Avarice still kept her seat, but her back was covered with blood. Come in, my daughter, come in, the robed and bearded man was saying, and then, come in, my son, as Shasta panted up to him. He heard the gate closed behind him, and the bearded stranger was already helping Avarice off her horse. They were in a wide and perfectly circular enclosure, protected by a high wall of green turf, a pool of perfectly stilled water, so full that the water was almost exactly level with the ground, lay before him. At one end of the pool, completely overshadowing with it with its branches, there grew the hugest and most beautiful tree that Shasta had ever seen. Beyond the pool was a low, little low house of stone roofed with deep and ancient thatch. There was a sound of bleeding, and over at the far side of the enclosure, there were some goats. The level ground was completely covered with the finest grass. Are, 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 are you, panted Shasta, are, are you King Loon of Archenland? The old man shook his head. No, he replied in a quiet voice. I am the hermit of the Southern March. And now, my son... Waste no time on questions but obey. This damsel is wounded. Your horses are spent. Rabadash is at this moment finding a ford over the winding arrow. If you run now without a moment's rest, you will still be in time to warn King Loon. Shasta's heart fainted at these words, for he felt that he had no strength left and he writhed inside at what seemed the cruelty and unfairness of the demand. He had not yet learned that if you, if you do one good deed, your reward usually is to, be, is to be set to do another and harder and better one. But all he said out loud was, Where's the king? The hermit turned and pointed with his staff. Look, he said, there is another gate, right opposite to the one you entered by. Open it and go straight ahead, always straight ahead, over level and steep, over smooth or rough, over dry or wet. I know by my art that you will find King Loon straight ahead. But run, run, always run. Shasta nodded his head, ran to the northern gate and disappeared beyond it. Then the hermit took Aravis whom he had all this time been supporting with his left arm, and half led, half carried her into the house. After a long time, he came out again. Now, cousins, he said to the horses, it is your turn. Without waiting for an answer, and indeed they were too exhausted to speak, he took the bridles and saddles off of both of them. Then he rubbed them both down so well that a, that a groom in a king's stable could not have done it better. There, cousins, he said, dismiss it all from your minds and be comforted. Here is water and there is grass. You shall have a hot mash when you have, when I have milked my other cousins, the goats. Sir, said Quinn, finding her voice at last, 
Will the Tarkina live? Has the lion killed her? I, who know many present things by my art, replied the hermit with a smile, have yet little knowledge of things future. Therefore, I do not know whether any man or woman or beast in the whole world will be alive when the sun sets tonight. But be of good hope. The damsel is likely to live as long as any of her age. When Erebus came to herself, she found that she was lying on her face in a cool bed of extraordinary softness, in a cool, bare room with walls of undressed stone. She couldn't understand why she had been laid on her face, but when she tried to turn and felt the hot, burning pains all over her back, she remembered and realized why. She couldn't understand what delightfully springy stuff the bed was made of, because it was made of heather, which is the best bedding, and heather was a thing she had never seen or heard of. The door opened, and the hermit entered, carrying a large wooden bowl in, her, in his hand. After carefully setting this down, he came to the bedside and asked, How do you find yourself, my daughter? My back is very sore, father said Erebus, but there is nothing else wrong with me. He knelt beside her, laid his hand on her forehead, and felt her pulse. There is no fever, he said. You will do well. Indeed, there is no reason why you should not get up tomorrow. But now, drink this. He fetched the wooden bowl and held it to her lips. Erebus couldn't help making a face when she tasted it, for goat's milk is wet rather a shock when you are not used to it. But she was very thirsty and managed to drink it all and felt better when she had finished. Now, my daughter, you may sleep when you wish, said the hermit, for your wounds are washed and dressed, and though they smart, they are no more serious than if they had been cuts of a whip. It must have been a very strange lion, for instead of catching you out of the saddle and getting his teeth in you, he has only drawn his claws across your back. Ten scratches, sore, but not deep or dangerous. I say, said Erebus, I have had some luck. Daughter, said the hermit, I have now lived a hundred and nine winters in this world and have never yet met any such thing as luck. There is something about all this that I do not understand. But if ever you need to know it, you may be sure that we shall. And what about Rabadash and his two hundred horse? said Erebus. They will not pass this way, I think, said the hermit. They must have found a ford by now well to the east of us for there they will try to ride straight to Anvard. Poor Shasta, said Erebus. Has he far to go? Will he get there first? There is good hope of it, said the old man. Erebus lay down again on her side this time and said, Have I been asleep for a long time? It seems to be getting dark. The hermit was looking out of the, win out of the only window which faced north. This is not the darkness of night, he said presently. The clouds are falling down from Stormness Head. Our foul weather almost always comes from there in these parts. There will be thick fog tonight. The next day, except for her sore back, Erebus felt so well that after breakfast, which was porridge and cream, the hermit said that she could get up. And, of course, she had once went out to speak to the horses. The weather had changed, and the whole of that green enclosure was filled, like a great green cup with sunlight. It was a very peaceful place, lonely and quiet. Quinn at once trotted across to Erebus and gave her a horse kiss. But where's Bree? said Erebus, when each had asked the other's health and sleep. Over there said Huynh, pointing with her nose to the far side of the circle. And I'd wish you'd come to talk to him. There's something wrong. 
I can't get a word out of him. They strolled across and found Bring lying with his face toward the wall. And though he must have heard them coming, he never turned his head or spoke a word. Good morning, Bree, said Erebus. How are you this morning? Bree muttered something that no one could hear. The hermit says that Shasta probably got to King Loon in time, continued Avarice. So it looks as if all our troubles are over. Narnia at last, Bree. I shall never see Narnia said Bree in a low voice. Are you well, Bree dear? said Avarice. Bree turned round at last, his face mournful as only a horse's can be. I shall go back to Kalomin, he said. What? said Aravis. Back to slavery? Yes, said Bree. Slavery is all I am fit for. How can I ever show my face among the free horses of Narnia, I who left a mare and a girl and a boy to be eaten by lions while I galloped all I could to save my own wretched skin. We ran as hard as we could, said Huynh. Shasta didn't, snorted Bree. At least he ran in the right direction, ran back. And that is what shames me most of all. I, who called myself a war horse and boasted of a hundred fights to be beaten by a little human boy, a child, a mere fool, who had never held a sword nor had any good nurture or example in his life. I know, said Avarice. I felt just the same. Shasta was marvelous. I am just as bad as you, Bree. I have been snubbing him and looking down on him ever since you met us, and now he turns out to be the best of us all. But I think it would be better to stay and say we're sorry than to go back to Kalormin. It's all very well for you, said Bree. You haven't disgraced yourself, but I've lost everything. My good horse, said the hermit, who had approached them unnoticed because of his bare feet, because his bare feet made so little noise that on the sweet dewy grass, so little noise on that sweet dewy grass. My good horse, you've lost nothing but your self-conceit. No, no, cousins. Don't put back your ears and shake your mane at me. If you are really so humbled as you sounded a minute ago, you must learn to listen to sense. You're not quite the great horse you had come to think from living among poor dumb horses. Of course, you were braver and cleverer than them. You could hardly help being that. It doesn't follow that you'll be anyone very special in Narnia. But as long as you know you're nobody special, you'll be a very decent sort of horse, on the whole, and taking one thing with another. And now, if you and my other four-footed cousins will come round to the kitchen door, we'll see about the other half of that mash. And that is the end of this chapter. So our next chapter is called... The Unwelcome Fellow Traveler. So another very interesting chapter. Let's kind of think about what happened in this one. Remember how they were dawdling? And that was Bree's fault originally. And because of that, Rabadash's army was gaining a certain lead. But notice what happened. A lion pops up again. You see these lions keep popping up in these different moments. And the lion attacked Avarice and attacked her back and wounded it. But then what did Shasta do? Shasta did one of the bravest things that you could imagine. Even when the war horse is going, you know, running away from that lion, Shasta jumps off of the moving horse going at full gallop. And he goes right back without a sword, without any kind of weapon. And he just yells at the lion, go home, go home. And the lion goes home. 
I mean, imagine if that was you. Imagine if there was a lion there and you just went up to it saying, go home. That takes a lot of courage. But he knew that he had to do something because avarice was going to be eaten. And so courage is one of those things in those moments in which we find ourselves in these difficult moments, we can sometimes fall into running away or we can really do something great. We can go back and face the danger. And that's what Shasta did. And so that lion was able to go away and Aravis was rescued. But notice what happened to Bree. Bree, if you notice during this time, he's a, he's a war horse. He always talks about how great he is. But he's starting to realize that he's not as great as he thought he was. He was great compared to dumb horses. But he started to realize that he was a little bit of the coward too. But notice how he just wanted to just go home go back to become a slave. Maybe sometimes we do that in our own lives where we sort of think of ourselves as really, really strong and important and then something happens and then we fall, we become weak. And maybe there's a temptation to say, you know what, I'm just gonna go right back to, you know, being, you know, being, uh, um, you know, going back to the way that things were before versus still going on that adventure saying, I'm just gonna go home instead of continuing the journey, the voyage, because I'm no good for anything. Have you ever had that experience? Maybe, maybe you make a mistake. Maybe you fall. Maybe you don't do as well. Maybe on your test, maybe you get a paperback that isn't always the best. And maybe we kind of just say, well, I'm just going to give up. That's what uh, Bree was doing. But notice what the hermit did there. He said, it's important to discover, you know, that we're not all that. This is what humility is. Humility helps us to know that there is a God and it's not me. And the more that we learn that, then we actually can become a very decent sort of person. It's when we're really kind of focused on ourselves and thinking that we're better than everyone, that's when we get ourselves into trouble. That's when we fall into pride and into arrogance. So... Let's see what happens with Bree. Seems like there's something happening in his own heart, maybe very similar to what was going on in Edmund's heart many, many years ago. So next time, we're going to read The Unwelcome Fellow Traveler. And I believe this might be one of the most important chapters. So we'll see you then. All right, and I do see one of my friends here, Mr. Oscar, saying very good chapter. This this was, this was a really, really good chapter. I think you're gonna like the next one even better. So get ready. See you guys tomorrow, same time, 1.30. So we'll, we'll meet at that regular time. All right, God bless, bye-bye.